guys for this last one.
You're there to guide us, Lord. You're there to strengthen us. And Lord, may we never forget that you're there, that you're there always. Lord, thank you that you're here right now, right here, Lord, in our very presence. Lord, through your Holy Spirit living in, living in us, Lord, you're about to teach us. You're about to teach us more about you, Lord. And Lord, we're not here. We're not here to learn more theology. And Lord, we're not here to learn more philosophy. Lord, we're here to know you more. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, Lord, to do just that. And thank you, Lord, for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, as we turn the lights up, why don't you turn and say hi to your neighbors? Big bird. All right, guys, come on in. You may be seated. I had prepared a theology and a philosophy lesson, but Mike said we're not here for that. So I'm not sure what we're going to do now. Just kidding. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and um, turn first to the book of First Chronicles chapter 6. And once you're there, if you can hold your place and then turn to the book of Romans, chapter 15. Well, I'm glad to see everybody back after uh, we went through the genealogy, five chapters of genealogy last time we were in the book of First Chronicles. Um, I'm sure through that, if you were here, you saw that the Bible truly is inspired every bit of it. And there's gold to be found in every bit of the scriptures if we take the time to to see and to investigate. And I like how the Bible says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and that he will show us great and wondrous things that we hadn't known before. And I know it's uh, that's been the treat for me to be able to just study the Bible on a regular basis, these these revelations, these things that God shows me that I never knew before. And it's a, it's a constant thing. And it makes it just so exciting to get into His Word. And so tonight, um, if, you're, um, if you're in Romans, we're going to start there. Romans 15, hold your place in 1 Chronicles 6. Romans 15. And 1 Chronicles does contain the longest genealogy in Scripture, um, nine chapters of it. We made it through chapter 5 last week, and the hope is tonight to make it through chapter 10, through chapter 10. Chapter 10 begins the narrative portion of the book. So, uh, and we'll, these genealogies in the um, last several, and we're just going to kind of skim through those, so. Romans 15, look at verse 4. It says, For whatever things were written before, so that kind of includes 1 Chronicles, whatever things were written before, 
they were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, isn't that interesting? And we also see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, how it talks about the things that were written before they were written for examples for us to learn from the things that happened with the children of Israel and all these things. And so there's great profit from that. And you'll notice he says that as we learn through the scriptures, there's great comfort and there's great hope. And this, isn't that neat about scriptures that in them we find hope? And I, I, boy, I'll tell you, so many times I look into the scriptures and the Lord just speaks through his scriptures. And we looked at on Sunday how God's word is effective and it's it's just this this thing that's constantly breathing life into us and breathing encouragement and comfort and hope and that's why God went to such great lengths to give us this scripture so turn back with me so that was a just by way of introduction because sometimes uh, that's why I'm, I'm glad we don't just decide which things we're going to talk about every week because through the whole scripture we find the whole of God the Bible says it Jesus is written in the volume of the book, and we find this to be true. So as we come to chapter 6, I want to remind you of the encouragement that's in the genealogies. We looked at that last week, but we have these genealogies that are, uh, it seems on the surface, just a list of people, and you read through them, and somebody begat somebody, and another person begat another person, and on and on and on. But what we see written here is this divine working of God so specifically, so detailed, so perfectly that that the way God works, he doesn't waste anything and that he does have a plan that's working towards an end. And so in the genealogies, it gives us this great encouragement as we see all these characters, all these figures all these people involved that that God worked his plan out, even when it looked bleak or impossible or like it wasn't going to work out. We see the divine hand of God working through all these individuals and all these individuals had a perfect part in the working of God. And for us, for us, it tells us the same thing that that we can take encouragement knowing that that God is faithful to complete what he started in us. Sometimes things, things don't seem like that. Things seem like maybe God forgot about us or his plan sort of skipped over us. And those in these genealogies could have say, said the same thing. I think of Joseph, how God gave him these great promises and, and it just didn't seem like they were going to work out. You know, he was put in a pit, he was put in jail, he was falsely accused. But we get to see the end of the story and we get to see how God worked all those things out perfectly, not only for him, but for the whole nation of Israel and then through the whole world, through the working of his plan. Now, that's the deal when we look at these genealogies and, and we just are taking an overview of it. Some of it's uh, kind of a fun review of some of the people that we've looked at so far in our studies. Now, I just want to take a brief moment to kind of put the Old Testament in perspective. The Old Testament, sometimes you read it and it's hard to understand the order of events or the chronological way things worked out. In the beginning, it's a little easier because it's more chronological. And then you start to to work your way past where we are in after first and second Chronicles. And you you can start to wonder how this all fits in. The neat thing about it is we've almost covered the whole of the Old Testament. I'll tell you, I'll show you what I mean. So we start off in Genesis, right? We start off with creation. Adam was born. And Adam was then eventually a descendant that would lead to Abraham. Abraham then was the guy who God spoke to directly. And God told Abraham that through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So God's wheels are in motion. 
He said that and he chose Abraham because God was pointing to the Messiah. And that's where the volume of the book is written about Jesus Christ. So he picks Abraham and he speaks to Abraham about this blessing. Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. From Jacob, he has these 12 sons, and those are the 12 tribes of Israel. These 12 tribes of Israel then, at the end of Genesis, they are in captivity in Egypt. They are slaves in Egypt. That's how the book ends. And so when we find the next book in Exodus, these people who had come from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons, the 12 tribes. Now, because of famine, they end up in Egypt and they're slaves there. They're captive there. And in the book of Exodus, God calls Moses to be a deliverer for the nation of Israel, to deliver them out of this captivity under the bondage of the harsh taskmaster, the Pharaoh, the king who is over them. And so he chooses uh, Moses to lead them out of Israel and God does that through miracles and these great events the the plagues and then the Red Sea and then the children of Israel go into the desert and that's where Moses received the Ten Commandments that's where God begins to work through this these 12 tribes to teach them to depend on God and God gave them the law as a way to govern themselves and they were to depend on God. God was going to be their God and they were going to bear witness through their relationship to God of what God was like to all the nations around them. So the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, those books primarily dealt with the 40 year wandering period in the desert after they were delivered and failed to enter into the promised land if you may recall, uh, because of the lack of faith. So as they went through the wilderness, that God was taking them into the promised land, and they got right to the border, and they were afraid to go in. They didn't trust God, and so they remained in the wilderness for 40 years. Deuteronomy basically recaps that whole wilderness experience, and then we get to the book of Joshua, where God then calls Joshua to lead the children into the promised land, which was the place back where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived before. So through Joshua, God was leading them back into the land. As they went into the land, they were to be strong and courageous because as they went into the land, the land was now inhabited with enemies. And so they had to fight when they went into the promised land. God said that that he would give them every bit of the land that their foot touched. So he would give them the victory as they went on into the promised land. And then in the book of Judges, we see as they're in the promised land, we see the the time where they had different judges over them, and they sort of went up and down between strength and weakness, between trusting in God and not trusting in God. And then in, in the, fir- the two books of the kings, First and Second Kings, that's the time when they're in the promised land and they have kings reigning over them, starting with Saul and then David and then Solomon, and then on through the series of all those different kings that we saw. And through those kings, we saw the dividing of the kingdom into the north and the south. We saw the weakening of the children of Israel because the failure to heed God's word, to trust in God's word, that they became just like all the other nations. And so through those two books, First and Second Kings, we saw the, the weakening of the nation, the dividing of the nation, until at the end of Second Kings, we see them taking, being taken on into captivity once again. And of course, The northern kingdom called Israel, they were taken by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom was taken later, and they were taken into Babylon by the Babylonians. Now, other than that, then you have the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, which speak about the children of Israel coming back into the land after 
about 60 or 70 years, they had been captive by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. So Ezra and Nehemiah are all these books about them going back into the land. And that's pretty much it. That's, that's the whole testament right there. And so the book of the prophets that we see that you know, we'll get to in a little bit, maybe. Those books are written during these times. And sometimes it's hard to put those in place unless you understand this time frame. But you have some prophets who talk about and prophesy before the nation of Israel is taken captive. And then you have some prophets that prophesy after they were taken captive. And so you have the two different sets of prophets prophesying during those same times. So then you have about a 400-year period after that until you come to the birth of Christ. And that's pretty much the Old Testament in a nutshell. Now, so how does First and Second Chronicles fit into all this? Well, First and Second Chronicles were written after the exile. So last week, or la- not last, a few weeks ago, when we finished Second Kings, we saw the southern kingdom taken into captivity. The northern kingdom was already in captivity. Okay, Now, the thing is, when they went into captivity, they were assimilated into the population. They became Assyrians. They became Babylonians. There was a a great disconnect by the time they were going to go back into the land about who they were, about being Jews. A lot of them felt like they were more Assyrian or Babylonian than they were Jews. They had forgot about how their forefathers worshipped God. The temple wasn't an issue. They weren't celebrating the feasts and all those things that they were called to do and so you have this really weird situation to where you you have jews that have no connection to their history their ancestry no connection to who they are their roots or anything like that worshiping in the temple and first and second chronicles probably written by ezra was to reorient them with who they were to reinstitute their Jewishness, their heritage, to reestablish their customs and traditions. And so there's a great emphasis in First and Second Chronicles on one of the most important figures in Jewish histri- history who you'd have to understand, and that's David. You have to understand David if you're going to connect with your past. And not only that, there's a great emphasis on the temple. You have to understand the temple if you're going to reconnect with the way to worship God. And then, of course, the ark as well. So it's, it's sort of like, and, and that, that would be a very difficult job, you think about it, for, for Ezra, you know, to try, to try to get them Jewish again. You know, it's sort of like all of us here probably feel American. And what if someday somebody told you you would have to go back to wherever your ancestors were, European or Africa or China or Asia or whatever. And then you had to be that. You had to fully be that. You'd be like, I don't, I don't even feel like that. I feel just like an American. You'd have to eat their food. You'd have to worship the way they worship, do all their things. So that's how the children of Israel felt now. They had become so assimilated into their population, the anti-God population. Their names were changed, and the Babylonians and the Assyrians purposely tried to do that to get rid of their culture and their identity as Jews. So that's why this book was written. So hopefully that makes sense. And so if you look at verse 1 of chapter 6, basically it starts off then with, the Levites. And the thing about the Levites, you'll, you'll notice in verse 1, it says, the sons of Levi, and then it says who they were, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. They were the sons of Aaron. And now, it's important that we point this out because the Levites, they were from 
the, the, Le, the Levi family, they were descendants of Levi, and their specific roles were to serve. They were to be a family that was dedicated to service. Now imagine if you've, you've been in Babylonian, Bab- Babylon, and, and now you're going back to the land, and they're telling you you're to be dedicated to the service of the Lord and to the Lord's people because of your last name. That's what's happening here. So he's talking about Aaron and his sons. And Aaron and his sons, of course, now, those were the people who, the Levites were the people dedicated to service. Aaron and his family were dedicated to be the priests. You you had to be from Aaron's line to be a priest. Now that means basically all priests had to be Levites. But not all Levites had to be priests. Does that make sense? So you, you could be a Levite, but not from the family of Aaron, not a descendant of, it, of Aaron. So in verse 1, he talks about the sons of Levi. Gershon, he was specifically responsible for carrying the tent. Kohath was in charge of the furniture and Merari was in charge of the boards. Now, it's interesting that you see these things pointed out, and it speaks of the, the specifics of the roles that they had in service. And the emphasis here with the priesthood, this is interesting, was to be service. They were to be servants. And that was something that was to be set in stone from the very beginning, that people that were in the work of the Lord, were to be those who served. That was to be their characteristic. That was to be what they were noted by. So in verse 48, if you go down a little bit, it says, And their brethren, the Levites, they were appointed to every kind of service of the tabernacle of the house of God. I really, I really started praying about that and meditating upon that. And when you look in the New Testament, we realize that we, in Christ, are all priests. In 1 Peter 2, 5, it says, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. And then in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, so this speaks of what a believer in Christ should be. And I look at it like this. As, as believers in Christ, woven into our spiritual DNA is serving. That's how God made us. He, he made us in this new birth, to be servants. And Jesus pointed this out quite a bit, didn't he? We see in Matthew 23, 11, he said, The greatest among you shall be your servant. And then in Mark 10, 44, he says, Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, this idea of servanthood, Jesus said, this is greatness in the kingdom of God. And I really think it's important that we once again get our focus back, our emphasis back on this aspect of Christianity, which is it comes down to the essence of who we are. And I find that a lot of times their Christian culture is creating an environment where things are done so the body of Christ doesn't have to do it. And the body of Christ often can feel like if they give money to somebody else to do it, that they should do it. But that's a complete opposite model of what we see in Scripture, especially as we see us as the priests of God spiritually. And I believe that a lot of discouragement, depression, a lot of frustration comes because when our Christianity 
revolves around narcissism and an emphasis on self and a promotion of self. And an individual grabs on to that idea. What happens is that individual becomes self-focused. And that's a tough thing for us. It, it's God is gracious enough to give us times to allow us to see how selfish we really are. Have you ever had that? I have a lot. Sometimes you, you think you're doing pretty good and, and then something happens and you realize that you, you're still full of yourself. And that's why I think it's so important that you and I understand that our, our life is to live, be lived for something much higher than ourself. And a lot of times we get upset. It's because the ambitions that we have that we think are higher than ourself, they really end at ourself. And then when we have this collision of our motivation and our preoccupation with self, that's when we find out that we're really not dead to ourself anymore. And those are painful times, but those are great times. You know the times where you, you just are bothered by somebody who doesn't treat you well, or you don't get something that you think you should get, or you just think something's unfair or not right, or, or maybe you're not treated well, maybe it really is true that you're treated unfairly or unjustly. But the reality is, as the Apostle Paul said, he said, I don't count my life dear to myself. And you know why? He said, so that I may run my race with joy. And see, there are times when we can slip back into this preoccupation with ourself and we always will get very discouraged in those times. We'll get very disappointed. We'll begin to, to feel like we've not measured up, like we're a victim, like everything is against us. And now we become these spiritual narcissists again. When in reality, if we're dead in ourself and alive in Christ, Dead people don't care if somebody's rude to them or mean to them or if they don't get their way. We're, that old self is dead. And now the only thing that matters, the higher motivation, is that God would be glorified through us. So that's something that's higher than us. So now we can get trampled on, pushed aside, stepped on, because the way we respond to that, if we respond to that, with good and not returning evil for evil, now we're really bringing glory to God. But you see, built into our Christianity then is the way this happens and we can encourage this type of attitude is that we would look at ourselves as servants, that in God's eyes, our highest position is to be a servant, to go and serve, whatever that may mean. We all have different gifts we all have different ways that we like to serve, but the bottom line is that we need to stir up our gifts. We need to be actively serving, loving, reaching out, whatever that may be and however that may be. And in that is where we find great joy in that act of service because that's how we're made now. We're made like that. We're born again like that, that, that we're like Christ and Christ was a servant, so we will find our greatest fulfillment in serving, in loving, in reaching out, and doing that even sacrificially, because when we do that, now we're doing it as Jesus did it. We're not doing it to get something or to be somebody. We're doing it out of the simple joy and pleasure of serving another individual, knowing that we're really serving God like that. And that's the beauty of being a servant. And I, I want to encourage you to, to get involved and, and do things. And especially we find the importance of that in a local church. That in the local church, you're stirring up your gift. You're 
edifying, encouraging, and you're, the things that you and I are doing are actually building up the church, which is actually building up individuals. So being a servant. Now look at, um, go down to verse 31. This is kind of neat. In verse 31, it says, Now these are the men whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark came to rest. So remember, there, these are instructions from Ezra when they're going back into the land. And one of the big emphasis, is, emphasis here is that David appointed men over the, song, the service of song in the house of the Lord. That this, this was something that, that was critical, that was important. The emphasis of the, the song ministry or the worship ministry would be that David would see when the ark came in to the temple that they would appoint people to be head over or lead over serving in song. And I, I like how he says that because, again, you have the emphasis that whatever we're doing, whatever our thing is, it has to be we're serving people. That's what service is. We're, we're serving. And if, if we have a gift of, of music, then basically the emphasis is to do that as unto the Lord and serve with all that you have. Be all that you can be as you serve the Lord. Do it heartily as unto the Lord. Now we find the importance of music ministry, of course, all throughout the Bible. One thing that pops to mind is in 2 Kings 3.15 when Elisha, he says, bring me now a musician. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. So we see a, a direct correlation there for some reason. I don't know how this all works, but we see when the musician played, that's when the hand of the Lord came upon him. And so we see a great emphasis on the music ministry. Now look at verse 33. In verse 33, it says, These are the ones who ministered with their sons of the sons of the Kohathites. And then it mentions a guy named Herman the singer. Herman the singer. Now, he's an interesting guy who comes up in, in the scriptures quite a bit, actually. But he wrote um, Psalm 88. No, that was somebody else. Never mind. Scratch that. Um, Psalm 89. Yeah. If you'll turn there for a second. Psalm 89. Herman the singer. Have you guys ever heard of him before? Me either. <laughs> Herman the singer. Herman the monster I have. but Now, here we get a song written by Herm. <laughs> Psalm 89. And it's, it's interesting because this, we find that these songs that were written, they were really from the heart. And notice what it says in Psalm 89, 1. It says, Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you and incline my ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles. And my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength. Adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in the darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves. Now, that's heavy, huh? You guys see that? It, this is interesting because hopefully we can identify with this. 
hopefully we can, we can look into this and say, hey, here's a guy who actually has a song that's in the Bible. And he was going through a really hard time. He was really struggling. He was really down in the pits. But yet through this psalm, you see this, this continual crying out to the Lord. He trusts in the Lord. So they, what I'm saying is these are normal things. These are normal things to feel and have. Sometimes we feel like if, if we're, we're not like Mary Poppins, we feel like there, we're just something's wrong. And, and if you read through Bible history and biographies, you'll find some of the greatest men and women of God went through great times of depression discouragement spiritual attacks that were very heavy but they always also did the same thing they cried out to the lord they continued to do the things that they knew to do they continued to stay steadfast waiting upon him and the light would appear they resisted the temptation of sinking back into despair by rejecting the lord which is the attempt of the enemy to get us away from the Lord. So in those times of discouragement and depression, those are normal. They happen to people. The key is to continue on, to stay focused on the Lord, to don't condemn yourself, to know that these things happen, and to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Those are the keys in those dark and discouraging times. Now, look at um, 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 39. So in, in verse 639, we find somebody may be a little more familiar. It, Herman's brother, in verse 39, was Asaph. Have you guys ever heard of him? And he stood at his right hand. And this is the first mention of this Asaph in the Bible. And this guy, you're probably more familiar because he authored 12 Psalms, Psalm 50 and Psalm 73 through 83. Now, Asaph is a good person to be familiar with, especially in 1 Chronicles, because in 1 Chronicles 16.5, he's described as the chief at the ceremony that brought in the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. So he must be very important in his music ministry. In 1 Chronicles 16, 7, it said that David delivered a, a psalm to Asaph and his brethren at the ceremony. So ap apparently David wrote a psalm, gave it to Asaph to perform at the ceremony when they brought in the Ark of the Covenant. In Psalm, or I'm sorry, First Chronicles 16, 17, Asaph was left with the responsibility to daily minister before the Ark of the Covenant when it was brought into Jerusalem in David's name. And then future worship leaders and musicians were known as the sons of Asaph. So, pretty important figure. So, if you go to chapter 7, We'll, we'll move on. Basically, chapter 7 goes through various families. We're not going to spend any time there. If you go to chapter 8, you're looking at the family of Benjamin. And then if you go to chapter 9, chapter 9 speaks about the genealogies that were preserved. And this was really important because they're going to need these genealogies when they're going to go back into the land. And so we have the benefit of reading about those genealogies. And that brings us up to the first part of the narrative of this book, chapter 10. So in chapter 10, we completely shift gears now, getting through the genealogies. And so we start right with Saul, the death of Saul. This picks up or continues what was spoken about in 1 Samuel 31. If you look in verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines. 
and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. So this is the end of, of Saul's life, basically this chapter is all about, and it's recounting the story then of the death of Saul. And we learn from 1 Samuel 28 about the, the condition of Saul while he was running from the Philistines. It's interesting. It says, when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Now, that's interesting because we have an opportunity to have a great contrast with this condition with Saul and this guy who started off just so humbly, if you remember, just he, he was even sort of just couldn't believe he would be the one picked to be the king of Israel and is sort of hiding from his calling. And he just started off so humble. And he was a guy, as we read through his story through 1 Samuel, that had a real tough time dealing with success. We see that success got the best of him. They would have people cheering for him about how Saul killed his thousands. And he, it sort of went to his head. But we, we see in Saul, as we're looking at his tragic end, we see a, a, an incremental downfall. And that's, that's almost always how it is. An incremental downfall. We see a series of choices, a series of rejections of God. We see a, a series of his heart hardening. And as you, you go through that just awful tragedy of his life, you find in that that the downfall of us is very similar. And those times where we just sense something's not quite right or we feel conviction about something, those are really important times. We don't want to take too many steps down that that road of rebellion and rejection. We don't want to take any, but it's a slippery slope. We take that one step and it gets easier and easier and easier. And that's what we saw in the life of Saul. He would be a guy that we would look at as just somebody who had great potential, great opportunity, great blessings, and squandered it all. It's just a tragic life. But you know, you can it's interesting. Now he's he's about to die. He's running from the Philistines. And he's afraid. He's so afraid. He's trembling. His heart's trembling. But we we remember if we look back, there's a a story about a young David who confronted a Philistine, Goliath. Do you remember the story? It's amazing to contrast Saul here with a young David. Now, I just want to read a little bit for you in 1 Samuel 17, 4. It says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines. That was Goliath. His height was six cubits and a span. He was huge. He had a bronze helmet on his head. They say the, Phil the Philistines were the first to really use metals. They were, so they were able to have swords and helmets and armor and all this stuff there that's what made them so powerful one of the reasons they were so powerful they're also known for their drinking <laughs> so they had a lot of drinking problems um so he had a bronze helmet on his head he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze is very heavy and he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin between his shoulders. And the staff of the spear was like a weaver's beam. And his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a shield bearer went before him. So he had a guy that's carrying a shield around for him. And then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel. And he said, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Basically just calling him out, just saying, hey, if anybody could take me, come on down. What he didn't realize, and even the children of Israel and Saul didn't realize, 
This was all, it was the battle of, of gods. The Philistines' God versus the God of Israel. There's one guy that understood that, and that was David. That's why David wasn't afraid. That's why David was bold. In 1 Samuel 17, 11, it says, When Saul and Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Why were they, the, the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, why were they afraid? Because they didn't understand the spiritual battle, what was really going on here. And so they looked at him and they looked at themselves and they said, there's no way any of us could beat this guy. But they forgot God. And this is a warning for us. No matter what we're up against, we can never forget God. And God, again, will be faithful to complete what he started in us. And so we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be overwhelmed. When we forget God is when we feel like that. So we may have a Philistine in our life. We may have something that's challenging us, threatening us, yelling at us, whispering in our ear, making us afraid and trembling. And we have to go right back and say, my God is stronger. My God is bigger. I love that because in verse 37, now David says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of a lion and from the paw of a bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He's the only guy that said that. He's a little guy. He had the spiritual awareness to realize this battle belonged to the Lord. This battle wasn't about him. It wasn't about Goliath. It was about his God. And David was offended that this Philistine was mocking his God, David's God. And David had experience in his life. He had experience as he would take care of the sheep with fierce animals that God would deliver him, give him strength and rescue him every single time. He was able to connect that to his present situation. See, a lot of times we're not able to connect the word to our situation. A lot of times we have this separation of this is God in the Bible, but this is my life and this is my thing, and it doesn't work the same. Do you remember what we read in the beginning in Romans 15? It says these, these are examples for our learning to give us comfort and hope. The same spiritual battle goes on now, and our Philistine may look different, but the answer is always the same. And so we have this great victory in the Lord and we're begged to call on the Lord to be the one who fights our battles for us. So he's, he calls on the Lord. He said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me. And so Saul says to David, go for it and the Lord be with you. So you even see in the beginning, if, if, I think if I was Saul, the king of Israel, and this little guy is going to go out, I would kind of be like, well, yeah, that's right. God is with us. Let me do it. But we see these these doubts with Saul. that He's the king. He should have been out there doing that. But he was okay just kind of sending this little guy. It shows he had these seeds of doubt. It, it showed that, that he'd rather have this guy go out and do it. He, he probably didn't believe it could really happen. So in verse 48, David said to the Philistine, he said, you you come to me with a sword, a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword and a spear for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And we know the rest of the story. But now, now Saul here, at the end of his life, is in the mountains of same Philistines, are threatening him, and he's still not calling on the name of the Lord. He's still thinking in terms 
of himself, of his own abilities and powers, which were no match for the Philistines. He didn't learn anything from David. In fact, this event caused him to get jealous of David, didn't it? So those, those people would say, well, Saul killed his thousands. Well, later they would say, and David killed his what? It's ten thousands. So he, he had this jealousy. He, he just couldn't put his life in perspective in relationship with God. And that was his downfall. So in verse 2, it says, The Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. And the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and somebody else, Saul's sons. And the battle became fierce against Saul. Verse 4, And Saul said to his armor bearer, he said, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and he fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died. So Saul and his three sons died, and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that they had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. Now, do you see Saul's lack of faith in his sin? It had great repercussions beyond himself. All of those warnings of God, all of those, those times where, where God was looking to draw him to himself, all those rejections down the line had implications that were far greater than just Saul himself. Here we see that it, it affected his family, his sons, it affected the nation. So the, his sins had this ripple effect that went out into the whole nation. And that's how sin is. It's important to ask ourselves the question, especially if we're in a lifestyle of sin, is it really worth it? The Bible says, surely your sin will find you out. And God in His grace and mercy looks to save, looks to restore, but there has to be repentance. And this is what God is looking for. He's looking for us to turn back to Him. That's all. But the, the wages of sin is death, but the ripple effects of sin also go out farther than we can ever imagine. And so consider the cost. That's the, the message with the life of Saul. Consider the cost. Is it really worth it? Do you really think Saul would say it was worth it? Do you really think those who who live a lifestyle of, of sin and apart from God would say at the end, it was really worth it. And I'm really glad you don't find that very often. You find a lot life of regret and hurt, a life of pain, a life that God wants to save us from a life that God says, I want to restore you from all that. I want to restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the years that sin has eaten away. And you know, one of the greatest things is to see somebody's life restored in Jesus Christ. Somebody who's gone down that road of destruction and somebody who God has gotten a hold of and made a whole new person. Sometimes I hear testimonies about people's lives and they tell me what they used to do. I'm like, you? Really? You did that? It's just so surprising because God's transformation is so radical. And it's so, so neat to see a transformed life in Jesus Christ. So in verse 8, it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. Do you see, again, it's, it's a battle of their God 
and the true God. And so they're taking the head of Saul and they're putting it in their temple as a way to say, our God is stronger, our God is bigger. What they didn't realize is that God's allowing them to do that as they are an instrument of chastisement. They are an instrument of judgment would maybe be a better way to look at it. God just allowed them to be that instrument of judgment. That's all that was happening. And it's very interesting to see the control of God, even in a situation like this, that God is in control of the judgment. It takes us back a little bit to 1 Samuel chapter 5. Do you remember when the Philistines captured the ark and they put it in their temple? You remember that? Their temple, Dagon, was their guy, and they had a statue of Dagon in their temple. And so as the ark's in there, the next day they come in, and Dagon had fallen off their little throne that they made for him, face down before the Lord, before the ark. And so they put Dagon back up again, and the next day they come into the temple, and Dagon is again on the ground before the ark, but this time his legs or I'm sorry, his head and his hands had fallen off. And so they're like, one of these gods has to go. And of course, they take the Ark of the Covenant out. But now here they're remembering that, no doubt. And so they're bringing Saul in and, and saying, well, look, your, your God is so great and so powerful. But do you see how interesting this is? In, in our life, so often we think it's so much about us. But in reality, it's about our God. And it's about his glory and it's about the enemy or the evil one doing whatever he can in our lives so that God would not get the glory, that we wouldn't be lights for God shining for him, that we wouldn't be living out the very reason that we're here on earth and that's to glorify God. But when it all comes down to it, it's it's always about God. So God basically removed his hand of protection from Saul, allowing the Philistines to do that. Verse 11, And when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men rose and they took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and they brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh. And they fasted seven days. Isn't that neat? Even in the midst of all this ugliness. I like this because no matter what's going on in our society, no matter what's going on in our lives, it's always just about us and God. Sometimes, again, we get into issues with people or we get into situations in life and we forget that Whatever we're in, whatever we're dealing with, whoever we're dealing with, it's really about us and God more than anything. It's not about us and the person we're having a beef with. Or it's not about us and our situation. It's not about that at all. It's about us and God. So how are we going to respond? This is when our faith has the opportunity to act. This is when we get to prove that we're living for something higher than ourselves, that we're, we're willing to do whatever or go through whatever because we're really living for something much greater than ourselves, and that's the glory of God. And so we can go through whatever we can go through. We can deal with whatever we can deal with because in reality, how we respond is really between us and God. In the most difficult, trying times that we have in our life, are the times where we have the great opportunities to display great faith, like we saw with David and Goliath. So, winding down here in verse 13. So Saul died, and then it tells us why. He died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord. And that's so important to see that. Because it wasn't about anything else. It wasn't about his army or it wasn't even about the Philistines. It wasn't about him not having as much military power or might. The whole thing came down to his unfaithfulness to the Lord. You know what that tells me? The whole thing for me, it comes down to my faithfulness to the Lord. 
And that's what Paul said. He said, what's required of a servant of the Lord? Simply that he be found faithful. And again, this was incremental. He had these incremental downfalls that kind of grew and grew and grew where he just kept rejecting the Lord. So he was unfaithful to the Lord, and then it says that he did not keep the word of the Lord. And then that led to him consulting a medium for guidance. Now he's actually involving himself with darkness. In verse 14, but the Lord, but he did not inquire of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? But basically, God's just saying, ask me. Let me lead you. Let me do. And he didn't do that. It's so simple to me when I read this. It's so simple that wherever we are now, what, what, whatever issues we're going through, however far we've gone, just it's so simple to be restored. Just turn back to him. That's it. Ask him. Return to him. He says he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, as a result of, he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Wow. So what are we to say to all this? Basically, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. The Christian life is meant to be lived on a daily basis. To be lived on a basis where we're just simply going along our life trusting in the Lord. And that's it. As we trust in the Lord, we have these promises of God. And when we fail, He's there to restore us. He's merciful. He's kind. He wants to build us up. He wants us to grow in grace and to know Him and His love on a deeper level. So as we move forward in this book now, we'll begin to get a, a better idea of the importance of how to connect with God. There's a lot to do with revival. And I don't know if some of you read this, but um, Mike actually sent me an article how they came out with a new study where for the first time in America ever, there are less religious people or people claiming some sort of religious affiliation. And so we're definitely on a downgrade and in need of the Lord to revive us. So we're going to see that all throughout this book. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this evening and thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy towards us, Lord. I pray, Lord, as we as we leave tonight, that we just sense your presence in our life. I pray, Lord, that we would know you in a deeper way. Understand your love for us. I pray for anybody here who's just, just kind of having a tough go of it, Lord. I pray that you would minister to their heart and you would help them just to surrender whatever it is, Lord. Just surrender it to you that they would make it your problem and not theirs. Lord, show us the way. Light our path. Use our lives and let our lives mean something for the kingdom, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let love abound. Let us pray without ceasing and be thankful for everything. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Let's go ahead and stand and worship the Lord in, in song, the service of song. song that's good. <laughs>
you all have a great evening and rest of the week and we'll see you bright and early monday morning no sunday morning monday morning i slipped right past sunday